This is February the 5th, uh, 2010, and we're in Phoenix, Arizona. We were talking to Bob Johnson uh, as part of the Colorado River Board Oral History Project. Bob, thank you very much for coming down this morning and, and sitting down with us uh, for whatever time we're here. Uh, it's just a, it's a pleasure to have you. In fact, you're the first, uh, I believe you're the first non-California water agency person uh, that's part of this collection. So. Uh, That'll be a nice change of pace. I want to, uh, you wound up your career with the Bureau of Reclamation, and we'll get there. Uh, but uh, let's go back to the early years and talk about how you got into the water business in the first place. Uh, what's your background, and how did you wind up at the Bureau? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I grew up on a farm in northern Nevada in a, a small town, Lovelock, Nevada, which is about 90 miles northeast of Reno. And uh, when I uh, graduated from high school, uh, my dad was a farmer, uh, and uh, it actually, in Lovelock, it's actually a reclamation project that the water for the farmers come from. So my dad irrigated with water from the Humboldt project. The Humboldt River uh, is a closed basin that uh, flows from the Ruby Mountains in northeastern Nevada all the way down to an area called the Humboldt Sink. It's the longest river in the world that doesn't empty into a larger body of water. Now, what that tells you is there's not very much water in the Humboldt River. <laughs> and, uh, but the Bureau in the 1930s, I think, uh, as part of the uh, Roosevelt, uh, you know, put people to work era, built a uh, rye patch dam, and uh, that captures and stores water for the farmers in the uh, in the uh, Lovelock Valley. So that would have been what, a WPA project? It was a WPA, yeah, a lot of it was done by WPA. And uh, so I grew up on a farm that was irrigated with reclamation uh, water. Uh, although it's interesting, I didn't know who the Bureau of Reclamation was. Uh, all I knew, and all my, well, most of the farmers in the valley knew, is that the dam was built by the government uh, and that they were responsible for repaying the costs but the whole project was uh, operated by the local water district and the farmers had, to my knowledge, no interaction with the Bureau of Reclamation at all. So I didn't know who the Bureau of Reclamation was. I graduated from high school, I went to college, I got a bachelor's degree in uh, agricultural business. Uh, I went on to graduate school there, I got a master's degree in agriculture and resource economics. Uh, Where are we talking about? University of Nevada, Reno. Okay. And uh, uh, it was towards the end of my master's program, and I had deci decided uh, to go on and get a PhD. I was accepted at University of California, Davis. I was all set to move there. I'd actually uh, gotten an assistantship, and we'd actually uh, gotten a reservation to live in the married student housing, my wife and I. And uh, about a month before I was going to move to Davis, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation called me up and said, uh, would you be interested in coming over for an interview with us? And the first thing I did was run up to the library and look up the Bureau of Reclamation to find out who they were. <laughs> and uh, and uh, as it turns out, I went uh, for an interview that was in, uh, I think, probably July, June or July of uh, 1975, and uh, talked to the Bureau. They offered me a job. Uh, it sounded pretty good. It, it, uh, at the time, it paid about as much as you could expect to get as a beginning professor at a university. And I was going to spend three more years going to school to, to uh, or two to three more years going to school to get a PhD. And I thought, well, you know, I might as well go to work now rather than continue in the academic year. So I went to work for the Bureau in Sacramento. Uh, worked there in water on the uh, Central Valley Project, uh, a little bit on the projects in northern Nevada, nothing on the Humboldt Project, but the Truckee Carson Irrigation District. But most of the work there was on the Central Valley. I did, I was an economist. I worked as an economist. I did economic analysis for water planning, uh, benefit cost analysis, financial analysis on repayment, and uh, farm budgets, which were the vehicle that was used to estimate what farmers could, could afford to pay for water. Uh, and that's how rates were set in the Central Valley Project, was based on the ability to far of farmers to pay uh, for the water delivery. So I did uh, the work associated with that in, in California. I, you know, I should say that I never had any 
uh, vision when I was young or when I was going to school of working in the water business. It just kind of happened. I, the, when the Bureau offered me a job, I was in the water business. Well, it sounded like you were headed either for agriculture or for academic. Right. Yes, that's that's what I was that's what I was headed for. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, worked there for four years, uh, and in 1979, I transferred to the regional office of the Bureau in Boulder City, Nevada, which is the lower Colorado region of reclamation. That's the office that deals with the lower basin of the Colorado River system, has responsibility for Hoover and Parker and Davis dams, controls the operation of the river, basically serves as the water master for the Colorado River system. So I moved there in 1979. I worked in the planning division, uh, and uh, I was an economist. Uh, I spent a lot of my time uh, from 1979 to 1987 uh, working on the Central Arizona Project, which was at that time under construction. But while it was under construction, the Central Arizona Project, uh, authorized in 1968, had never really been planned. They really hadn't figured out exactly what they were going to build and where and how big it was going to be and, and all the various pieces. So. The final planning for the project was ongoing at the same time construction was ongoing. And in my view, it was probably the most exciting place to work in the Bureau of Reclamation at that point in time. There wasn't much construction activity. This is the end of the era of the Bureau of Reclamation as a major construction. Uh, it's still in the construction business, but not to the extent that it was. It's moved more towards water management. And the Central Arizona project was probably the last really big reclamation project. Uh, constructed by the Bureau. Was that parallel uh, task, planning and construction, going on simultaneously, was that unusual or...? It, it, well, there was always uh, some degree of planning that happened when uh, a project uh, was being built. But most of the time, the, the model was for the planning to occur in, in detail uh, before Congress authorizes its construction. And uh, that didn't occur with the Central Arizona Project. There had been planning. There was a general sense of what facilities would be built. Uh, and Congress authorized the project in 1968. But um, the details of the planning had just not been worked out. It's the canal alignments, whether or not there was going to be regulatory storage and where it might be built. Uh, you know, who was going to get how much water had never been determined. Uh, you know, to the allocations of water to irrigation and municipal and industrial and Indian tribes had not been made. Um, so there was still a lot of planning. Building the distribution systems to take water from the main canal to the communities and the farmers uh, in, in central Arizona. None of that had been uh, developed. Uh, and normally there would have been more work done on that prior to the time the project was authorized. Uh, so anyway, this planning process was ongoing and the Bureau was constructing the facilities and I got very heavily involved in the economic analysis uh, for those features of the Central Arizona project that were under construction, which was basically the whole project with the exception of the initial reaches of the canal out of the Colorado River. Did you find it ironic at the time, and I think you know the story, that uh, uh, Arizona vehemently objected to Metropolitan Water District in California uh, building Parker Dam and, and its intake uh, at, uh, at Lake Havasu, and, and you, know, you probably know the story, you weren't around, but you know the stories about the Arizona Navy, and, and, mm -hmm. and so a lot of them are myth, but mm -hmm. uh, they're fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, and then in 1968, the Central Arizona Project uh, essentially uses the four bay created by Parker Dam, which they objected to, to uh, pump water out of the Colorado River for Arizona. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that ever came up in, in your discussions when you were there. but It did to some degree. Um, I, I mean, there was a uh, knowledge, uh, a general knowledge among all the reclamation people that worked there about the Supreme Court decree in Arizona versus California, that that really opened the door for the Central Arizona project to be built and the authorization followed four years after the decree. So there was a general sense, I think, but not in detail. I mean, I actually became very uh, knowledgeable of all that when I got more involved in the broader management of the whole Colorado River system. 
But uh, at that point in time, you know, my focus and the Bureau's focus was on getting the Central Arizona Project built, so there wasn't a lot of time dwelling on the past. It was certainly understood what, is, what was happened. You certainly heard about the animosity between Arizona and California, especially when you work with the local uh, water users. And the fact that Arizona had agreed to make the Central Arizona Project the lowest priority in the lower basin was certainly on the minds of all of the folks that worked on the Central Arizona Project. So all the planning for the project had to take that into consideration when it looked at future water supplies and you know shortages and how, off shortage, how often shortages would occur and how would that affect the, the design and the operation of the project. That was all very much in everybody's uh, mind and understood well by all the people that were doing. But in terms of, you know, the history at, uh, at uh, it was talked about around the office. It wasn't a formal thing that was recognized in the studies or anything. But yeah, it was talked about in the office, those, those kind of historical studies a little bit. Well, since you raised the, and we'll get back to this timeline, but since you raised the, the issue of uh, animosity between Arizona and California over Arizona's lower priority to Colorado River water. Uh, the lore in California is that Arizona willingly accepted that priority in exchange for California's support for funding for the CAP. And again, I'll underscore, that's the lore. Is, is that your recollection, having worked No, oh yeah, that's absolutely right. I, that's what, uh, but, but from Arizona's perspective, uh, yeah, then what are they mad they were, about? They were blackmailed. <laughs> you know, it was held over their head. They had won. You know, I mean, from their perspective, they had won the Supreme Court decision. Supreme Court decision said Arizona was right. They have the, the right to divert and use this water. California had been arguing Arizona doesn't have the right to the water. And so they won the Supreme Court decision. So then the door was opened. I mean, you know, the history of the project, what brought the litigation in the first place was if Arizona was trying to get the Central Arizona Project authorized by Congress. And the California delegation and Californians argued to Congress, you can't build this project. Arizona doesn't even have a right to the water. And that's what prompted the, the suit in 1952 between Arizona versus California. It was 12 years with the Supreme Court. And finally in 1964, the court sided with Arizona on that issue. So now the door is open. They won the Supreme Court battle. Okay, now we can build our project. And so they go to work with Congress to get their project built. And California still objects even after they've... And so finally this deal was struck. Because California had so many members of Congress that they could effectively block Arizona in the Congress from getting the authorization. And uh, so, you know, Arizona had to make that concession to get the project authorized. And of course that was debated uh, in Arizona for a long time whether or not that was the right decision for Arizona to make and probably still debated to some extent today. But it's a fact and I think everybody recognizes that that's you know a fact that isn't going to change <laughs> and uh, you know I think Arizona has accepted it and is uh, you know planning their management of the Central Arizona project around that fact. Uh, you noted uh, Arizona v. California, the longest running Supreme Court case in history, to the best of my knowledge, uh, is dated 1964. But in reality, it really wasn't finally settled it, until the latter days of your career at the Bureau, uh, when they finally came down with some, uh, you, you'll know the term of art better than I, but there were some final judgments or final determinations. Mm -hmm. uh, you were at the Bureau as, as that case was finally yeah, concluding? Yeah, yeah, I think that was the Kushan Indian tribe piece. And okay. there's always, I mean, yeah, that they decided the issue between, the big issue between the states, uh, and they issued a decree in 1964 right. that said, here's how the Secretary of Interior as water master is to operate the system to comply with the Boulder Canyon Act, which is the act that really allocated the water among the three states. But there were still all these claims uh, over who has rights to how much water, uh, and especially as it related to Indian tribes. There were five Indian tribes uh, in the lower basin of the Colorado River system that had claims to water, uh, and uh, so all of those had to be settled. And the settlement of those kind of strung out over a period of time after the initial decree 
uh, was issued. And so, yeah, that carried on for a very long period of time. Yeah. I, I think it was uh, only finally settled just a very few years ago. Yeah, no, at the Kwishan tribe, and I'm not sure that even that's finally settled. I still think that there, I, it, it, it still had not completely been settled. And Matt had negotiated an agreement with the Kwishan tribe about um, the land area that could be served. Oh, ir irrigable acres. Irrigable acres. And I still don't think that a final decision uh, has been made on actually how many acre feet of water goes with that land area. But I think there was some sort of a negotiated uh, uh, agreement on the land area. And then you still haven't determined how much water gets allocated. Amazing. It's amazing how political water can be. Yeah. Well, I digress significantly. Let's take you back to Boulder City. You were the, you got there because you, you left and came back in, in another capacity. Uh, so you're in Boulder City. Uh, you're you're wrapping up, I guess, to the CAP, and, and you're an economist. And yeah, I, I um, actually after two years there, I got promoted to the. Uh, be the chief economist, and there was a small staff of economists in Boulder State, I think about five. So I became the supervisory economist that oversaw the rest of the staff. And there were other planning activities going on in the region, some in Southern California, the Santa Margarita Project, there was some power planning things that were going on at Hoover Dam, uh, expanding the capacity at Hoover was under consideration. Uh, development of pump storage facilities around Lake Mead was under consideration. So there was a whole bunch of planning and I worked on those too. But most of my activity was Central Arizona Project and uh, what was really great about working on Central Arizona Project, you were, you, was, you were doing the planning, you were formulating what facilities were going to be built, the EISs were being written uh, and complied with, and as soon as the EIS was filed, construction was starting and uh, they were out there you know moving dirt and, and building facilities so you could actually see your work uh, being implemented whereas most of the time in planning and reclamation in those days you did planning and then you had to wait for Congress to authorize and it may or may not get authorized and in most cases during that area nothing new was being authorized and built and with the Central Arizona project you were very actively involved in doing the planning, but then also seeing the project get built. So it was real exciting. I mean, one of the things that I worked on was the what's called the Plan 6 component of the Central Arizona Project, which uh, is the, really the, the flood control and regulatory storage pieces of the project. There was originally Orem Dam was authorized, which is a dam that would have been located at the confluence of the Salt and uh, Verde Rivers here in the Phoenix area. And it was a large dam that would have done a couple of things. One, it would have pr provided flood protection to the Phoenix area uh, by having that dam there from the Salt and Verde rivers that occurred from time to time. But the second thing, and probably the more important thing that it would provide, was uh, storage for the Central Arizona project. I mean, you got a 300 mile canal, uh, and you really need some place to be able to store water so that you can store that water and, and be able to release it and meet the demands further downstream on the canal. Operating a 300 mile canal without some significant storage was really uh, uh, a difficult thing to do. So regulatory storage was a very important part of that. Warren Dam became controversial from an environmental perspective. There was an Indian reservation that would have been inundated. The Indian tribe, the Fort McDowell Indian tribe, uh, objected to building Warren Dam. And it became a project that was uh, uh, targeted in the Carter hit list in, uh, I think it was 1978, uh, President Carter uh, uh, published a list of Bureau of Reclamation and Corps of Engineers projects uh, for which they would not, for which they would not seek funding. And Orem Dam was one of the facilities that was targeted. And uh, so it became apparent that Orem Dam couldn't get built and uh, the Bureau, along with uh, all of the local water community, embarked on this. They called it the Central Arizona Water Control Study. And the, the acronym was CAUCUS. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody always talked about CAUCUS, which was this huge study. I think it was cost $10 million to, to do the study, which was a huge amount of money at the time. This is like in the late 70s. 
That study was just getting underway when I arrived in Boulder City. And I got involved in the middle of that study. And it took, oh gee, probably, I don't remember when the record, it took four or five years to do the study. And they looked at a broad range of alternatives and ended up, including Orem Dam, uh, and ended up uh, selecting, they had, I don't know, seven or eight plans and that was identified in the study. And the one that was selected was called Plan 6. <laughs> So it was the sixth plan among all the alternatives that were considered. And what Plan 6 was composed of was enlarging Waddell Dam. There was an existing Waddell Dam on the Agua Fria River, which was just west of the Phoenix Valley. Uh, and it crossed the canal. It was very close to the canal. So by raising that dam, you could create a lot of storage space. Uh, and that became the regulatory feature of the Central Arizona Project. And it's built and there today and operating and it serves its purpose very well. Uh, and so that was selected as, but it also then the other part of Orem Dam was to provide flood control for the Phoenix Valley. And so two other major dams were selected as a part of Plan 6. One was to raise Roosevelt Dam, which is the main existing dam of the Salt River Project. Uh, and that's a bureau facility, uh, originally constructed by the bureau back in the 1900s, early 1900s. And it was an old dam, and it had significant dam safety problems. The spillway wasn't large enough to pass the, uh, the in, what they call the IDF, the inflow design flood. So it was recognized that you had to make some structural changes to that dam anyway. So that was selected raising the dam, they raised the dam by about 70 feet, which is a big distance, you know, a pretty high raise, created a lot more storage capacity, which was then, and they built a new spillway, which was then uh, used to capture those big flows and keep, keep, stop the flooding, and then also provide the safety of dams protection. So that dam was authorized. And then... Uh, uh, authorized as part of the CAP? Yeah, it was selected. It wasn't authorized, but it was selected as this Plan 6. You didn't have to go back to Congress. It was determined that this project was already authorized. Even though it said Orem Dam, they got an interpretation from the attorneys that you could build an alternative to Orem Dam. And this became the alternative, part of the alternative. And uh, then the, the third major dam was a dam called Cliff Dam, which would have been located on the Verde River. And uh, in total, at the time, I think the total of all these dams was like, the cost was somewhere around, oh, I don't know, four or five hundred million dollars. They ended up costing a billion dollars. One of the interesting things is Cliff Dam never got built. And it basically got eliminated uh, from the Plan 6 project later on. It was initially identified, the EIS was completed. Cliff Dam was primarily for flight control it would have also provided some additional water supply, but it became very environmentally controversial. Uh, there was a bald eagle's nest located in the, in the reservoir area that would have been affected, and the bald eagle was endangered uh, at the time. And so there was an endangered species issue, and uh, the recreation and the habitat of the, of the, of the river, of the Verde River, became a big issue. And so um, the national environmental organizations were opposing it and uh, they were going to litigate the whole Plan 6 project and basically the Arizona congressional delegation negotiated uh, a deal with the environmental groups to eliminate Cliff Dam from the Plan 6 facilities in exchange for their agreement not to litigate on the two other features, the Waddell Dam and the, and the Roosevelt Dam. What year? Well, let's see. That would have been that that was struck in nineteen probably nineteen eighty seven, nineteen eighty eight. Okay. I, I was in Washington DC. I transferred to Washington DC. I worked in Boulder City until nineteen eighty seven. I transferred to Washington DC in nineteen eighty seven and I worked there in eighty seven and eighty eight. And uh, I actually I, be, I I became the person in Washington that knew about the Central Arizona Project. So every time something on Central Arizona Project came up back there, they, they called on me. And I had the background to go in and explain to all of the, the commissioner and the assistant secretary. And what, what was your role, your well, official role? In, well, in my history. official role was chief of the contracts and repayment branch. So, so I became 
the chief of the uh, overseeing reclamation wide all of the water uh, water delivery contracts and uh, contracts for repayment of reclamation projects. So uh, I had kind of taken on a bureau wide role when I went back there and uh, associated with water water which was a big deal. I mean that was a uh, water water contracting was a controversial area of the Bureau at the time. There was always debate over subsidies and pricing for water delivery and all that fit into the negotiation of contracts for sale of water. And so my role was to oversee that on a reclamation-wide basis. And uh, so it was a good job. And, but, and you were there for two years, till 80, 89? 87 and 88. 87 and not 88. very long. I got caught up in a big reorganization. They did a major reorganization of the Bureau. And I ended up transferring back to Boulder City uh, in 1988. Uh, I went there in 87, came back in 88. So it was and, a little over a year. And what did you come back as? I came back as, and, and, and then in 1988 was when I really became very heavily involved in the Colorado River and dealing with all of the management aspects. You know, my first tour in Boulder City focused more on the Central Arizona Project and its use of Colorado River water. But in 1988, when I came back from Washington, I became the chief of the Division of Water, Land, and Power Operations. Uh, <laughs> okay, now, what does that uh, really mean? <laughs> <laughs> it means that uh, I oversaw the uh, uh, broader aspects of the operation of the Colorado River in the lower basin. Is that a couple steps down from a regional director or is it an it's, Yeah, it's a couple or? of steps down from the regional director. Okay. Uh, that's the, the job. Actually, that job today is called the area manager of the Boulder Canyon Operations Office. Okay. Uh, so they kind of, it's changed. It's exactly the same uh, division with exactly the same responsibility. It just took on a new title and name. And since uh, since I was there, there's been, no oh, I don't know, let's see, one, two, three, four, four, I, I'm four removed now from uh, when I worked in that job. The, the person that had that job for a significant period of time that's so well known by everybody since I had the job was a gentleman by the name of Terry Fulp, who's now Assistant Regional Director in Boulder City. So a lot of people will, in the current day, will recognize that job by re referencing Terry. Uh, but uh, that was a great job. Uh, this it was a, a relatively small staff, about fifty people, <clears throat> and uh, that staff actually provided the oversight on the operations of the river. So we had a power group that oversaw the operations of the generators at Hoover, Parker, and Davis Dam. Did the reviews, make sure they were doing the proper maintenance, uh, that sort of thing. There was a lands group that oversaw the management of all the reclamation lands in the region that were owned, and, and there was uh, then the water group that did all the hydrologic analysis uh, on the river and developed the annual operating plan for the Colorado River every year in conjunction with the Upper Colorado River Basin and the office in Salt Lake City. So that's a that's an annual process that reclamation goes through, and, and uh, the job that I had oversaw the development of that annual operating plan and interacted on a very regular basis, uh, particularly with the lower basin states, uh, but also with the broader seven states as it related to developing a joint operations plan for the whole system. Timing-wise, then, you would have, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that you would have gotten involved in multi-state Colorado River issues rather than CAP. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Uh, at, at the very time when things were really starting to boil. Yes. Uh, and, and so I'll let, I'll let you talk about that boil because you seem to know where I'm going with that and rather than me yeah. putting words in your mouth. Yeah. What, what was in the cauldron there when you yeah. came back in 89 that you had to deal with? Yeah. Well, the Central Arizona Project was getting close enough to, to completion that it was beginning to divert significant amounts of water. And even though Arizona won the, the battle in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said that California could continue to use uh, Arizona's water as long as Arizona wasn't using it. So California continued to divert 5 to 5.2 million acre feet even after the Supreme Court decree. But they were borrowing about uh, uh, 
six to seven hundred thousand acre feet of water from the state of Arizona. So well, they weren't really borrowing it. They were well because they didn't have to pay it back. Well, you're right. Borrowing. You're right. Borrowing is the wrong word. They were utilizing, yeah. and they had legal right to utilize it. Supreme Court clearly said they could use it. So borrowing is the wrong word. I, that's an Arizona word. Borrowing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the Arizona word might be stealing. <laughs> Well, I think the Arizona I, word was. I, I always <laughs> had to strike the balance, uh, you know, between all of the all of the states. But anyway, yeah, and California had every right to do that. There was no problem with that. But what was happening is Arizona was now beginning to utilize their share. Nevada was starting to grow in their use, although Nevada's entitlement is so small that it didn't really make uh, you know that big of an impact. But it became it was beginning to become apparent that. California was going to have to take reductions in its diversions of Colorado River water by a significant amount. And the, the biggest problem was that was that the Metropolitan Water District that serves 17 million people in Southern California had the lowest priority for water use uh, in California, which I'm sure everybody else has talked about over a long period of time in, in all of these uh, uh, in all of these interviews. but so, it was recognized then that the Metropolitan District was the one that was going to have to take the hit because of their low priority. And um, um, everybody was really nervous about that because that's a large urban area. It was a significant amount of the water supply for the urban area. And everybody was concerned about the political ramifications of making that kind of change. I mean, not just California, but the other six basin states. And in fact, I think among the other six basin states, there was some real concern that California would not willingly abide by the decree and reduce their use. So there's big nervousness in that period of time about how California would react to reducing its water supply. I think to Met and to California's benefit, they recognized that. And I, from day one, I think the Californians were always cognizant that they needed to do that and were not for a minute thinking they didn't have to comply. But what happens, in 1988, Arizona was beginning to divert more water. Uh, California began to recognize that the urban area couldn't take the, the reductions. And so the idea was, well, look, we got all this agricultural use, over 3 million acre feet, 3.85 million acre feet, is that right? Is that the right number? Or three point yeah that's right three point eight five million acre feet is used by agriculture, and we'll just work out deals with agriculture where agriculture allow some of their water to transfer to the urban areas, and metropolitan will be able to be kept whole through these agricultural water transfers. And in fact, Met started to recognize that even before nineteen eighty eight, and they began negotiating. I think in eighty six and eighty seven uh, with the Imperial Irrigation District, which is the largest holder. Uh, to purchase uh, some of their water so that when these reductions had to occur, uh, uh, they, they could happen from agriculture and that they could pay agriculture for making the reductions. And uh, in 1988, right after I became the chief of the Water, Land, and Power Operations Division, uh, one of the first things that landed on my desk was this brand new agreement between Metropolitan and Imperial. Uh, for the transfer of 100,000 acre feet of water, or roughly 100,000 acre feet of water. from, And the plan was for Metropolitan to pay for water conservation in Imperial. Imperial's water use would decline, and uh, Metropolitan, being their lower priority user, would, would get the water. And uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, that nobody had counted on is that there is an intervening priority, the Coachella Valley Water District, has a priority under what well, the seven party agreement uh, that gave them a priority below Imperial but above Metropolitan. And in fact, Coachella was very concerned about their being able to get all the water that uh, they had historically used. And when this deal came along where IID was going to transfer its use to Metropolitan, Coachella stepped up and said, now wait a minute. <laughs> we're an intervening priority, and if Imperial doesn't use that water, it belongs to us. And uh, so they actually filed uh, uh, for litigation, or filed litigation in 1988, right after the deal was brought uh, to us for consideration. I, I don't think they were asking for us to approve the deal. 
I think what they were asking the Bureau do, to do was to provide a letter that said we would operate the river to accommodate the transfer so that we would allow that water to be diverted by Metropolitan and it would just be a natural part of how we would operate the river system. We would follow the priorities of the seven party agreement and that water would automatically go to Met and they wanted us to write a letter to that effect. That's what they were asking us to do and that was part of the responsibility of my office at that time and that landed on my desk. Well, immediately Coachella is objecting and that's uh, in the in the personage of Tom Levy. In the in, right, Tom Levy, who was the general manager, who was the relatively new general manager at the time. I think he'd only well, let's see, when, he'd only been general manager for three, four years, maybe something like that. Um, and he and I remember at the time, um, uh, the Imperial Valley Press called me up, and I was pretty naive about everything that was going on, and called me up and asked me, you know, what was going on, and I think I said something about uh, Coachella being the lowest priority among the ag users in California, and that IID had a higher priority, and if IID uh, had the water and could transfer it, that it could go to, you know, Metropolitan. I think I made a statement somewhere along those lines that Tom Levy went ballistic. <laughs> <laughs> And so we sat back and rethought uh, what we had said, and we looked hard and we thought about it. And I, I think we began to conclude that maybe Coachella had some legitimacy to its claim. And I think we told that to Imperial and, uh, and Met that, you know, gee, you know, there may be some legitimacy to this Coachella uh, complaint. And, it, and I think, I don't know if that influenced, but I think. In the end, they, they came back, they negotiated a deal with Coachella. They met or? Met or, and Imperial. Or I, had, I, I don't know if it was both. Well, they were both being sued because they had come to this common okay. And uh, they, they negotiated a settlement of the litigation that basically said that Coachella would get half of the conserved water. Metropolitan would pay for it, but half of it would be available to Coachella. That was the agreement that was uh, negotiated. So the agreement got signed, uh, and Coachella dropped its objection, and we moved forward. W what was really significant there for us is I think that whole effort be made us all, I mean the Bureau and I think all of the users in California and to some extent in all seven basin states recognize that there was a problem with the water entitlement system in California. That in order to for California to reduce, there was going to have to be ag to urban transfers because the urban area couldn't take that big of a hit. And that the legal framework uh, in the California system, the seven party agreement with the tiered priorities, wasn't going to accommodate water transfers. That you had intervening priorities like Coachella's that would make it difficult uh, for. Uh, uh, water transfers to occur. Every time you'd go to do a water transfer, you would have Coachella coming forward with their claim uh, that they had an intervening right and that the water belonged to them rather than the metropolitan area, even though the metropolitan district is paying for the conservation measures, but uh, Coachella had an intervening priority. And I think at that point we began to realize that, uh, that you were going to have to change the seven party agreement in order to, to get California to reduce its use and to uh, uh, there was a bit basic flaw in, in the formula in the seven party agreement. Right, and, and of course Metropolitan would not want to pay to conserve a hundred thousand acre feet if they were only going to receive fifty thousand right, acre feet. Right, right. So I mean you had that same financial disincentive actually. I, we should point out here, Bob, because some people who might be watching this 20 or 30 years from now, there are seven basin states uh, that have a right to Colorado River water as well as the Republic of Mexico, and you've made a number of references to the seven party agreement, which is a state of California agreement between and among the users of Colorado River water 
in California. Right. So they're two separate things, and, right. and you know that and I know that, but I didn't want anyone else to get confused. Yeah. Wait a minute, wait a minute, we got seven states, seven party agreements, what's going on here? Yeah. So uh, the seven party agreement is there, um, and it would probably be helpful to describe, if you recall, the uh, the path of water in this seven party agreement. It's uh, Palo Verde, uh, IID, and how all that works, well, because actually, there are numbers there. That the, 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 the first priority is Palo Verde, and Palo Verde gets all the water they want to put to beneficial use on, I think it's 105 or 106,000 acres of land, and they're in the Blythe area right along the river there on the California side of the, of the river. And then there's a second priority for the Yuma project. And the Yuma project is down in the in the Yuma area on the California side of the river. It's composed of Bard Irrigation District and the uh, Quishon Indian Reservation in California. And under the under that agreement, they got twenty. Uh, they got the right to all the water they wanted to put to beneficial use on twenty five thousand acres of land. And then the third priority, actually, the third priority was shared. Uh, by IID and Coachella, and it got broken down into priority, I think we called it priority 3A and priority 3B, and Imperial got the right to all they wanted to use in their service area when, you know, IID is the big kahuna, you, you know, in California on the Colorado River, but they're also the big kahuna uh, in, in the uh, uh, Colorado River as a whole. They are by far the largest water user anywhere on the Colorado River, it's just 3 million acre feet. Uh, of water actually it was 3.1, 3.2 million acre feet that they were using back in the in the late 80s and through the early 90s. But uh, uh, they had the next priority, and then the final priority was for the Coachella Valley Water District, who had a right to all the water they could put to use. But there was a cap on what all of those priorities could use, and it was the 3.85 million acre feet. So. There's 3.85 million acre feet and four priorities. First priority gets all they want. Second priority gets all they want. Third priority gets all its want. And then Coachella, the 3B, gets all it wants as long as the total is within the 3.85. Well, California Ag Use was up against that 3.85. They were using all of the 3.85 and there was this constant fear by Coachella that they were gonna get limited and actually get less than the one than the amount they could put to full beneficial use in their service area. So that created this tension that we talked about earlier where Coachella sued, Imperial, the higher priority was transferring to Metropolitan. Now Metropolitan then was the fourth priority and fifth priority under that seven party agreement and they got uh, the difference between the 3.85 million acre feet and then what was available to California on the Colorado River system, at least up to some limit. They got uh, what is it? It's uh, 600. And well, it was 550. Oh, 550. They had 550 under priority four, right. and then they had another couple hundred thousand under priority five, and then there's a sixth priority that gets some of its back to irrigation, and uh, and I don't remember the details, but there's a sixth priority too. Yeah. But basically, Metropolitan had the right, if it was available from the Colorado River, for the amount of water that's available over 3.85 enough to fill their canal, which was around 1.3 million acre feet. They, they had a right to enough on, if the water is available on the Colorado River system. Metropolitan also had the right to some of the 3.85 if all of the irrigation districts didn't use the full 3.85. So there was some thought that Metropolitan, and even still today, I mean, I think that happened last year is the uh, uh, irrigation districts didn't use all of their water and Metropolitan got some of that water under that priority system. Um, but, but anyway, that was the system that was in place and none of the ag districts had a quantified entitlement. They just had this right to all they could use and they shared this total quantity uh, of water and then they had these priority systems and because it wasn't quantified, it did not facilitate these water transfers from occurring. I mean, Imperial could agree to conserve 100,000 acre feet and implement measures to conserve 100,000 acre feet, but how do you measure whether or not they've achieved that reduction in use because they don't have a quantified entitlement? I mean, IID could take 
you know, say they implement a 100,000 acre foot reduction plan, they have an unlimited use. And they might be taking 3 million acre feet, conserve 100,000 acre feet, and still have the right to, develop, to divert 3 to 3.1 or 3.2 million acre feet. At least that was the way that IID uh, viewed it. And so there was just no clean basis from which to allow these water transfers to occur. And then you have that intervening priority that I always said, well, if they conserve any, irregardless of what, how much they use, it really belongs to us, that's Coachella kind of slipping in the middle. And so we just said, man, you know, this system's not going to work. It's not going to accommodate uh, water transfers. And I don't know, that may have been recognized by some before 1988, but I think it was the first time that I think the Bureau became, began to recognize that, it, that, it, uh, that there was a problem. And I think it really came home to all the water users in California, and certainly to some extent to water users in the other six states. Well, as you rose through the ranks at the Bureau, all of this stuff continued to go on. What, what power or what authority did you think, or do you think, the Bureau had or has to, to deal with that issue? Because it, it, it was a state issue. It was an in-state issue mm -hmm. involving the use of water provided by the Bureau of Reclamation, mm -hmm. the federal government. Mm -hmm. And that gets a little complicated. Right. Uh, so, I mean, what was your position with regard to what the Bureau could or could not do? I mean, are we talking bully pulpits? Are we talking withholding water? Are we talking... Uh, I don't know what we're talking about. Well, I think the Bureau <laughs> saw itself of, ha of having a responsibility to administer the delivery of water in the lower basin uh, consistent with the Supreme Court decree. Um, the Boulder Canyon Act uh, authorized uh, 7.5 million acre feet uh, to be allocated uh, uh, between the three lower basin states. And it, it, I, this is in 1920s. Uh, compact was negotiated in 22. Uh, it was determined the lower basin had 7.5 million acre feet to allocate. And then between 1922 and 1928, Arizona and California fought with one another over how much of the seven and a half million acre feet they should get. Nevada wasn't a player at the time. I mean, Las Vegas was probably ten or twelve thousand people, and they really didn't see. They really weren't involved in the controversy. They didn't see the need to try to reserve. There was no irrigable land in Nevada, so there was really no interest in Nevada to get a lot of water, and so Nevada got this three hundred thousand acre feet allocation, and then Arizona and and uh, California were arguing over the, over the rest. And it, they couldn't come to agreement. And in 1928, the Congress said, well, they're not going to agree, so we are going to allocate the water in the Boulder Canyon Act. And they gave 4.4 to California and 2.8 to Arizona, even though California and Arizona didn't agree to that. But then the, the Congress went on to say, the Lower Basin is authorized to uh, form a commission and negotiate a compact to allocate the water. Uh, but if the Lower Basin doesn't do that, uh, we hereby charge the Secretary with entering into agreement contracts within each of the three states consistent with the allocation that Congress has, uh, has recognized here. So, they allocated, the Congress allocated the water, but they left it open for the three lower basin states to negotiate something different if they wanted to. And then the Congress said, and oh, by the way, if the three states can't agree, we're going to put the Secretary of Interior in charge of administering these entitlements and entering into contracts to deliver the water. And uh, this, the three lower basin states couldn't agree. They couldn't negotiate an agreement. They, they did not form a commission. And so the secretary moved forward with entering into contracts with uh, water users in the, in the lower basin for the 7.5 million acre feet, recognizing the 4.4, the 2.8, and the 300,000 acre foot allocation that Congress had determined. And that, in essence, put the secretary in charge of the lower basin. Now, not everybody appreciated that, and I don't even think even the Bureau appreciated what that meant when that occurred you know, in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. When the Supreme Court uh, issued their decision in Arizona v. California, 
the Supreme Court reinforced the Secretary's role. And the Secretary, the, the Supreme Court said, the Secretary is in charge. State law does not apply here. This is a federal system. Congress uh, authorized the Secretary to administer this system. So this system is really this lower basin of the Colorado River, not the upper basin. I'm just talking about the three lower basin states. Supreme Court said when Congress passed the Boulder Canyon Act, they put the Secretary of Interior in charge of managing this river system. So the Secretary, and I don't know where the term came from, I don't know that it's formally in, the, in any of the law, but the Secretary became known as the Water Master. Uh, and the Secretary is still referred to as the Water Master in the lower base of the Colorado River, meaning that the Secretary has the responsibility, the legal responsibility, to deliver water and administer entitlements. Now what the Supreme Court further said in 1963 and, and in the decree in 1964 was that the Secretary, and I don't remember the exact words, it's attorneys and it's staff and you know everybody in the federal government is enjoined from delivering water supplies outside of the decision of the court affirming the Boulder Canyon Act. So the, the secretary is uh, enjoined from delivering water differently than, and the secretary takes that uh, Supreme Court uh, direction very, very seriously in, in managing the river system. So I think from the, from the secretary's, the government's, the federal government's perspective, uh, we felt like we had uh, a responsibility to limit entitlements in California and that we were the ones that was charged with that, not the state of California. Uh, and that that was our responsibility. And Did, I think, didn't that put you in conflict with California, with the California well, you know, entities? No, I, well, I, you know, there was a time, it was interesting, I, IID actually argued, there was an original lawsuit um, in, in Imperial Valley uh, where one of the farmers sued because the Salton Sea was getting so large that it was intruding on his farmland. Okay, that would be the Elmore suit. The, the Elmore suit. Right. And Elmore went to the state, and, and I think he, I don't know if they sued the state or Imperial, but it ended up in the state right. uh, asking the state to enforce beneficial use standards on Imperial Irrigation District because there was so much waste of water going on in the Imperial Valley that it was causing the Salton Sea to, so there's non-beneficial use. And he asked the state to step in and play the role of reducing Imperial's use. And interestingly, uh, Imperial Irrigation District at that point in time, and I think this is the mid-80s, argued that the state had no jurisdiction and that uh, only the uh, federal government, the Bureau of Reclamation, under the Supreme Court decree in the Boulder Canyon Act had the authority to do that. And so Imperial was arguing that didn't. Now the Bureau just kind of sit back and didn't play an active role, just served as kind of an observer of, of what was going on d during that litigation. In the end, the state uh, stepped forward and made a decision and said that, uh, Calif that Imperial was uh, using too much water and ordered Imperial to reduce their use by 100,000 acre feet. And then that's what drove the deal between Metropolitan and Imperial to do that original water transfer to implement concert. And that was really driven by the state's decision to go ahead and the court upheld the state's authority to do that. Uh, and the Bureau kind of sat back and didn't argue with it and, and in, at that point in time so, so there is a little bit of a, the, the, most of the, all, actually all of the entitlement of the Imperial Irrigation District uh, was created under state law prior to the Boulder Canyon Act being uh, uh, passed. And, and the, one of the things that the Supreme Court recognized in their decision was they are the, they, they, there are these present perfected rights that existed before the federal government came along and allocated the water and that those present perfected rights had to be protected uh, by the Secretary in the administration of the Boulder Canyon Act. It, in effect, uh, grandfathering in. Grandfathering in those water rights. And those water rights were issued under state law. So the argument would be that those are water rights that existed prior to the Boulder Canyon Act, prior to the Secretary's authority, and perhaps the state does play a role here. 
and can play a role. And in fact, they did play a role, and I think a very important role and an appropriate role. Um, and the Bureau kind of, I mean, quite frankly, the Bureau didn't want to get embroiled in these beneficial use issues. You know, I mean, this is the mid-80s, and the Bureau just didn't want to get drug into it. And, because? Well, it's a, a, a controversial, full of conflict kind of thing, and the Bureau just didn't want to, uh, you know, jump into that. The, the Bureau was reluctant to play that role, even though it had a significant amount of responsibility in the decree and the and the Boulder Canyon Act to do that, the bureau at that point in time. I mean, you know, everybody was kind of learning, you know, how this system was being going to be operated and managed. And the bureau was kind of took the attitude of, look, let's leave some autonomy to the states here. Maybe we have the authority to do all these things, but let's leave some autonomy to the states, just as a matter of policy, uh, to let the states make decisions within those states on how their water should be used. So the secretary fairly typically, when um, when the secretary would go to allocate water or enter into contracts with water users within the states under the Boulder Canyon Act, the secretary always went to the state water resource people and said, uh, we're considering entering into this allocation of water, does the state agree? And quite frankly, if the state wouldn't have agreed, my guess is the Bureau would have said, no, we won't enter into those contracts. Now, the exception was Indian tribes, because the Secretary has a trust responsibility in Indian tribes, and while the Bureau might consult with the state on, on Indian tribes, the Bureau would not necessarily, I mean, the Bureau might take the state on as it related to Indian tribes because of its trust responsibility or the Interior Department's trust responsibility. Okay, let me, um, let's take a break here. I need to change tapes because we're running out. Uh, and I want to come back to, because I think a little earlier you were really leading toward the quantification settlement agreement. I was, yeah. And, I, and, I, and because you had gotten into a discussion about Imperials and Palaverdes and, and Coachella's water being uh, unquantified, if I can right. make up a word. And, so, and that's a very important uh, event. So uh, let's stop the tape here. We'll take a short break and come back on tape two. with uh, Bob Johnson. It's February the 5th, 2010. Uh, Bob, we were talking about the role of the federal government and the role of the state government, California state government, uh, during a contentious time in, in recent water history, uh, talking about waste of water in Imperial and a lawsuit and conserving water and the priorities and the end quantification. So let's pick up the conversation at that point. Yeah. Um the, the, the Bureau, you know, in the 80s was reluctant to really get in and exercise its authority. I think the Bureau recognized that it had some authority, but it preferred not to, or to leave matters within states to the state government to deal with, as it, it, with the exception of Indian tribes. Indian tribes kind of took on a unique uh, perspective, but during that period of time, the Bureau was very much in the mode of saying if there's, a, if there's an issue between water users within a state that it was really up to the state to deal with those issues. And uh, so the Bureau kind of, even though I think the Bureau may have at the time said, yeah, we recognize that we probably have some jurisdiction here. Uh, you know, traditionally Western water law is governed by states and not by the federal government. In fact, the original Reclamation Act says that the Bureau shall defer to state law uh, in the management of its projects. That's part of the original Reclamation Act. So from a broad Bureau perspective, the concept of the state's role in the management of water was always recognized, and the Bureau was always very deferential to state law. And, you know, I think that the Bureau was following that model in the lower basin of the Colorado uh, River at the time. Out of... Uh, out of... Uh, just general respect for states and the need for decisions to be made at the lowest levels of, of government that is possible. Now, I think the word that the Bureau always used in dealing with the states was the word consult. Uh, I don't think the Bureau ever said, even during that period of time, that it was a state responsibility and that it didn't have the responsibility ultimately to manage the river and to implement decisions. 
but the Bureau very heavily relied on what the state said in those consultations. And I think that's what the Bureau was doing here in this original uh, battle in the State Water Resources Control Board between the Elmores and Imperial Irrigation District. I think uh, there is an argument there that state law does prevail uh, or can't or com does come into effect. And I think the end conclusion, uh, and you might want to talk to Bill Swan about this because he wrote an opinion on it. It'll be interesting. But you know, I, I think that there that you can argue that both state law and federal law applies on some issues. And I think this issue of beneficial use of present perfected rights on the Colorado River system that there probably is an argument that the states have jurisdiction. Uh, I also think that there's a very good argument that the federal government has jurisdiction uh, and is directed to exercise that discretion uh, in the Supreme Court uh, decision and decree. Uh, so there's probably some overlap. There's probably areas where they both have jurisdiction. Uh, now if they conflict, uh, th that's not happened. That did not happen in California. There, the Bureau didn't try to step in and change the state's decision, nor has the state ever stepped in. Fortunately, I think the state, in my experience, the state and the Bureau uh, have never actually run into a conflict uh, over decisions that were being made, particularly as, the, as they related to beneficial use. Uh, so the Bureau has been, uh, you know, they, th there's probably some role for both, and the role probably overlaps. They probably share some responsibility. Now, while this was going on, you had some interesting visitors uh, come to, to your offices in Boulder City uh, to, I guess, get the, the Bureau involved. I'll let you respond to that. But uh, some of the people are the subjects of earlier oral histories that are part of this collection. Mm -hmm. Carl Baranke, for example, I'm sure uh, stopped by once or twice. Carl was general manager at Metropolitan. Uh, perhaps Dwayne Georgeson, who was both... Uh, an assistant general manager at the uh, LA Department of Water and Power and then came over as an assistant general manager under Carl mm -hmm. at Metropolitan and, and Dennis Underwood uh, who would have been with the Colorado River Board. Can you talk a little bit about uh, one or all of those people and, and uh, what they were seeking and then of course Dennis is an interesting case because then he came back and he was your boss for a while. Mm -hmm. How did, how did that all work out? Yeah, well, it was, a, it was a really interesting time. Again, the Bureau was reluctant to step in and play a role and was really looking for the state or others to do that or for the entities within California to come agreement among, them, among themselves. I think that, if I recall right, while all these negotiations were going on between Metropolitan and Imperial for the transfer of water, there was a lot of turmoil and conflict between the entities as it relates to that. And my recollection while I was in the job as the Water and Land and Power Supervisor, uh, we uh, definitely uh, uh, had Metropolitan coming to us and asking the Bureau to get involved and play a more prominent role. To, and their, their thought was somebody needs to put pressure on Imperial Irrigation District to cooperate. And Bureau of Reclamation, you have the authority to do that, and we think you ought to step in and, and play a role so that we can make progress in solving these problems in California. And in fact, I remember uh, going to a meeting with Ed Hallenbeck and Carl Baronke, and it wasn't in Boulder City, it was in Metropolitan. And I think at the time, it was a battle over the All-American Canal. It wasn't over this water transfer, but it was over the lining of the All-American Canal and what was the responsibility of Imperial to line the canal versus the responsibility of Met, who was going to pay for lining the canal. In, in exchange In for exchange the for the water. Yeah. And there was a dispute there among them over how to make all the pieces of that operate. Who was who Ed Hallenbeck, by the way? That's oh, a new name. Ed, Ed Hallenbeck was the regional director of the Bureau of Reclamation at the time. So he was the top guy in Boulder City. And he's the one that was on the ground that really had the primary responsibility for managing the river system. I will say Ed was a good regional director. He was a great guy. I really enjoyed working for him. He, he really helped me in my career in reclamation. But I will also say that Ed was very much a hands-off guy. I mean, in terms of getting into the details of uh, what was going on. And he was a big picture, uh, uh, political, uh, you, you know, took 
took the politics into consideration in making decisions. But he relied on staff very heavily on the details of things, um, which was appropriate for, for somebody that was, in, that was in his position. So he was leaning back on me pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> during that period of time to try to deal with it since it was my office. He, he, he really believed in what he called participative management and empowerment of employees, and, which I think was, is a good way, and I, I actually agree with that. I think that's the way to manage an organization. But uh, anyway, I remember going to a meeting with Ed and Carl Bronke in Carl Bronke's office at Metropolitan where Carl was encouraging us to get more proactive and put pressure on uh, Imperial to be cooperative on this All-American Canal issue. And I can remember Ed being non-committal, <laughs> you know, listening and not, not, really making, uh, not really making any commitments. I remember after the meeting, Ed kind of looking at me and saying, well, what, what, you know, what should we do on this? Uh, Dale Duvall, I think, when that meeting occurred, was still the uh, commissioner of the Bureau of Reclamation, and Dale very much took that same view. I, I can remember when I was still back in Washington, right towards the end of my time back in Washington, uh, Duval was the commissioner. I remember sitting in a meeting. I think Imperial came back and met with the commissioner. I think Metropolitan came back and met with the commissioner, expressing their views. And I remember Dale Duval's uh, comment was, well, we're friends of both of you. And there's a dispute, dispute here among our friends, and and uh, we would like you guys to figure out how to resolve this. So there's this very much this. There's a dispute here. We really don't want to get involved. That was kind of the position that Ed took. That was certainly the position that the commissioner seemed to be taking. So not not much uh, not much was going on. Uh, the bureau was not playing a very proactive role, and was not doing what Metropolitan was urging. And, and in essence, by doing that, the Bureau was actually empowering Imperial, I think, to some degree. Uh, because I think that the, that the, the uh, Imperial was all, has, is and I think continues to be the, the very conservative in, in protecting its rights and also a very, very tough negotiator not willingly or very easily finding middle ground with the folks that it has differences with. And so in essence, by us not playing a role, uh, we were really helping Imperial. Now the state did step in. The state of California? The state of California, the water resources, and their decision actually is what forced the original deal. I, I don't think that original deal would have happened if the state water resources control board uh, hadn't have made the decision that they did. They basically ruled that Imperial was, was wasting water and that they had to conserve and then open the door for this uh, negotiation with Metropolitan. Okay. Where, uh, at that time period, where was the Colorado, pardon me, the Colorado River Board of California? Were they actively uh, involved in trying to reach uh, some solution? Or Yeah, yeah I, I, I should add that Dwayne Jorgensen, who was the deputy or assistant general manager, actually came to Boulder City on a couple of occasions and made similar kinds of pleas for us to get more proactive on things. So it wasn't just uh, 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 the general manager. But the, the Colorado River Board, you know, I don't remember them being, Dennis Underwood was the executive director at the time, and I don't remember Dennis really jumping in and saying to the Bureau, you ought to do this or you ought to do that. Uh, Dennis was a very proactive manager of the Colorado River Board and all of the agencies there and, uh, you know, was pretty good at getting the agencies to come together and agree on things. And pro I think that provided really good leadership in that regard. But I don't remember Dennis ever coming to us. I was never involved during that period of time in, in any meetings with Dennis. All the, all the meetings that I was involved in were with Metropolitan and a few with Imperial, where Imperial came in and argued that we ought to be taking their side uh, on these issues. So, but I don't remember the, the, the Colorado River Board playing a role there um, during that period of time. Right. Well, that specific issue would have been resolved by the time Dennis became commissioner of the Bureau of Reclamation. 
That is the Elmore suit in the 106,000 acre feet of water. Mm -hmm. I mean, that had been dealt with. But uh, did Dennis then become uh, any any different in, in the way he operated or in his thought process when he became commissioner? Uh, or were, were his thoughts about how water was to be divided and whatnot pretty much the same as they had always been? I, I think that Dennis felt like that the Bureau needed to be more proactive. Uh, I wouldn't say that Dennis came in and said, I favor Metropolitan or I favor Imperial on this, but I think Dennis came in as commissioner and I think it was his view that the Bureau needed to be more proactive. Uh, and it was, he, he actually, you know, Dennis worked with the Bureau and I remember when Dennis was the, in the annual operating plan meetings, I was the one that attended those meetings for the Bureau and I worked with Dennis and the states on trying to move the ball forward. And I think even when Dennis was the executive director of the board, he, um, he was very much a leader among the Colorado River Basin states, and he very much was interacting with the Bureau uh, on, on issues. But I don't think he was coming in at that point. I don't think he was telling us to play a more significant role. I, I, but when he became commissioner, it was very clear that he thought the Bureau should. And it, and it also, I think, became clear that, that even while he was executive director, even though I don't think I heard him say this, that he thought we should when he was executive director uh, because of the secretary's role as water master. And I can remember he was, he then, I think, became fairly critical of Ed for not, Ed Hallenbeck, for not being more proactive. Uh, and he, he, Dennis was, Dennis's style did not match Ed's style. Dennis was very much a detailed person. Dennis was very much, I mean, if you ever went into his office, it was stacked a mile high with material and papers, and I mean, he was reviewing everything, he was writing things, a very hard worker, very much into the detail of things. Great guy, just the most wonderful guy in the world, and Ed was too. But Ed was just the opposite. You ever went into Ed's office, there wasn't a piece of paper <laughs> on the desk, you know. Ed delegated it to all. And I think there was a, uh, a, a, a conflict of styles between Dennis and Ed. And I think one of the things that uh, 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 Dennis did when he became commissioner is I think he told Ed, Ed, you need to get more proactive in this. And you, the Bureau needs to become more of a player in, uh, in uh, managing the river. And, you know, I think Ed was a little taken back by that, and uh, but there was clearly, and, and Dennis didn't feel like Ed had been doing that when, you know, when Dennis was the executive director. So there was a conflict between Ed and Dennis when Dennis became. And I remember I was the chief of the contracts, or, or of the Waterland and Power Division, and Dennis had been after Ed. And, we, you got to remember, we, we had now recognized that there was this conflict. And th there was another conflict that, that was developing at the same time, and that was a conflict among all seven states because what California began to argue in about 1990, there was a drought on the Colorado River system. There was a drought in California in like 88, 89, 90. And, uh, and Arizona was beginning to use, use its entitlement. And... There had been a drought, but still Colorado River reservoirs were relatively few, full at that point in time. I mean, we had the big flows of 83 and 84, and the reservoirs were relatively full. But we had gone into a dry cycle, and we'd been in it for two or three years. And what, of course, Dennis was commissioner. And what California began to argue at that point in time was uh, the secretary ought to declare surplus. <laughs> and, uh, you know, under the decree, the secretary... Uh, has to enforce limitations, but the secretary has the discretion under the decree to determine that more than seven and a half million acre feet is available. And so what California began to argue was, well, yeah, Arizona's using its full entitlement, and yeah, the lower basin might use more than seven and a half million acre feet, but that can be fixed because all the secretary's got to do is declare a surplus, and California can continue to divert all at once. And there's a good argument for surplus if you look at the hydrology and how full the reservoirs are. It ought to just be an easy decision to make to declare surplus. Well, immediately all six other basin states began to really worry 
because now rather than living within the confines of the decree, California is coming up with a new argument on how it can t continue to use more water. So that argument created a lot of nervousness among basin states. I think California first made that argument in 1990. Now, when you say California, realistically, we're really talking about metropolitan, aren't we? Because well, of the no, way who the was ar were? no, who was arguing that? It was Jerry Zimmerman. Jerry was the executive director that followed uh, Dennis uh, of the Colorado River Board of California, and he's the one that represented California in the discussions among the basin states. And, you know, Metropolitan was always there in those meetings with the other states, as was Imperial, as was Coachella, as was Palo Verde. Um, but Jerry was the spokesman, and so he was the one that, uh, that made those arguments on behalf of California, not just on behalf of Metropolitan. So I, I would say, certainly Metropolitan was behind Jerry saying, yeah, 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 <laughs> and probably encouraging him. And it was a win-win for Jerry to argue, because Imperial didn't object to declaring a surplus. None of the other California entities. It was a real win-win for Cal for Jerry as the executive director to go argue that with the other basin states. So, so what was the? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, the argument was, you know, let's start declaring surplus. At the same time, you know, we had these transfers, and we began to have the debate over beneficial use in uh, California, and it became apparent that the decree was going to have to be enforced at some point in time. You know, this is from '88 into the early '90s. Uh, 90, 91, somewhere in that uh, time frame. And uh, uh, Dennis was now commissioner, and Dennis felt like the Bureau needed to start playing a more proactive role in dealing with all of these issues. And the Bureau traditionally had kind of sat back and said, well, you guys decide. And saying to the states, well, you guys decide. And saying to California, you guys decide. You work this out. This is not for us to get involved in. And Dennis was critical of Ed uh, for not playing that role, and I was the guy for Ed <laughs> that was dealing with all those issues. So, and you know, we, we looked at it, and we sat down with our lawyers, and we talked about, well, what role should we be playing? Should we become more proactive? And I think we began to come to the conclusion, obviously with Dennis's encouragement, but I think also in our own minds, uh, not just because Dennis thought it was the thing for us to do, and he was commissioner, certainly I think that had an influence, but I think we began in our own minds to think, yeah, uh, maybe we do need to play more of a proactive role. The, you know, we now have a, a dispute among states. It's not just within a state, but we've got disputes among states. And California's got a problem. And in the end, we're the one that's enjoined by the Supreme Court decree uh, from delivering more water than people have entitlement to. So we're going to have to deal with that, and we're going to have to get more proactive. And we began to recognize that, yeah, maybe we are the water master and maybe we need to do more. This is in the 1990-91 time frame. Ed, Ed was regional director and Dennis was commissioner. And I remember, so we came up with the idea. Bill Swan was part of that. I think you're going to talk to him. He was the lawyer, head lawyer for uh, Interior here in, in the Phoenix uh, solicitor's office. And between he and Bob Muller, myself, and LeGrand Nielsen, who was the chief of the contracts and repayment branch in Boulder City, uh, we kind of came to the conclusion we really needed to get more proactive and put together uh, a framework for managing the lower basin of the Colorado River and showing some leadership uh, to resolve these issues. And so one of the things that we did is we said, well, we need to draft some, some regulations that would define how water markets can exist in the lower basin, that can define how the Bureau is going to enforce entitlements in the lower basin. Uh, there was, there was uh, concern, and there still is concern today, that there are folks without entitlements, uh, non-contract users, or some people say illegal diverters, uh, and that we were going to have to deal with that and the enforcement of those issues. And what we decided was we need to put in place a regulatory framework for how we were going to do that. So we were, we began drafting in probably 89, 90 time frame a set of regulations that would define how the Secretary was going to manage the lower basin of the Colorado River. And I can remember uh, Dennis coming to Boulder City and he was not happy with Ed and the fact that we were playing a proactive role. And Ed called me in, and I came in and gave Dennis a briefing on what we were doing. 
and these regulations and everything in the regulations that we were going to try to address and that, yeah, we were getting ready to provide some leadership. And Dennis was just thrilled. Uh, we hit a home run with Dennis. He could see that we were finally stepping in and getting ready to play a role. And quite frankly, Ed, Ed was, I, I became Ed's favorite person after that brief. <laughs> because we had actually satisfied the commissioner that we were going to play our role and that we had a framework for doing that. So we, we had big support from Ed and he was very excited about what we were doing. And we started working on those reg regulations uh, pretty hard to, uh, uh, to put in place this new framework for managing the lower basin. Now, there were regulations that already existed. Uh, there were, there's a set of regulations that the Bureau wrote back in, 19, in the early 1960s uh, called the 417 Regulations, Part 417 of the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, the Bureau put in place those regulations laying out a framework for how the Bureau would enforce beneficial use of water in the lower basin of the Colorado River under its authority as water master. So those regulations already existed, although the Bureau had never used them. And I think what we decided was we wouldn't try to change those because those very specifically dealt with the issue of beneficial use, not water market transfers, not surpluses and shortages, not, uh, not uh, uh, you know, re reducing uses by non-contract diverters. They didn't address any of those issues. In these. But we already had these regulations in place to limit uses because of non-beneficial use. And so we, we decided in our, but we recognized that those were there and that those were a tool that we could use if we needed to. Does the Bureau have the authority to write and implement the regulation, or does it, what is the process? No, the, does it the, go to the Secretary, or? The, the regulation is, that regulation, in essence, the Code of Federal Re Regulations becomes a form of law. And what those regulations do, what regulations do, is they define how an agency is going to administer the law. Congress passes the law, but many times the law does not go into the detail on how the law is going to be administered. So in order to put a, a framework in place, what agencies do is they write regulations that says, here's the law, and here's, how, here's the details of how we're going to enforce the law. That's what a regulation is. And the 417 regulations were already in place. They are formal. They are a very, there's a very formal process to establish them. They go through public comment. Uh, and I think ultimately, yeah, they do get it. Whether or not they actually get approved by the secretary, it depends on what the regulation is. They may or may not get approved by the regulation. My guess is the 417 regulations probably did get approved by the secretary. So yeah, they probably were. They're a piece of law that's, that's developed and used by the executive branch to enforce laws that are, or to administer laws passed by Congress. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Anyway, those already existed. We weren't going to mess with those. We recognized that they were there. But we were also going to develop a new set of regulations that dealt with this broader set of, of issues on how we were going to administer entitlements in the lower basin. And we briefed Dennis on it. He was very excited about that. And we sat down and drafted those regulations. And it probably took us a year or two to get them drafted. And we ended up with a set of regulations about that thick that kind of laid out this uh, framework. And um, we actually then, we did not begin the formal process, because there's a very formal process. You send the regulations, they go through review in Washington, and they get uh, published in the Federal Register. There's a very prescribed process on how you implement regulations. Well, we drafted them locally. We didn't send them back to Washington for a review. And we floated them uh, for review. Uh, among the water users and the basin states, the lower basin states. Okay, and I think, just Arizona, Nevada, California? Well, we, we gave them to the upper basin states, too. Okay. And anybody that was interested, just an informal, here they are, uh, we're going to be moving forward with developing these. And uh, this, so we started them when Dennis was commissioner um, and, and Ed was the regional director. We worked on them. We really didn't get them done. Dennis's tenure as commissioner ended in 
2002. Uh, uh, no, 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 not no, late, later. 1992. Dennis was commissioner from in in Bush the first Bush administration. So he was commissioner from 1989 when Bush came in until when the first Bush administration went out in. 2002, and the Clinton administration came in. So he was the commissioner for basically about four years. And we started working on the regulations about half halfway through Dennis's tenure as commissioner. And uh, started moving forward with trying to be more proactive in dealing with the Colorado River system. And uh, I'm just trying to think, what else did we do? With Ben or with Dennis, well, okay. One of the other things that we did with Dennis, which was, we we recognized that we needed to be more proactive. We recognized we had the problem in California, and we recognized that uh, the quant the seven party agreement didn't work, and so we uh, became very. And I'll come back to those regulations in, in a little bit because I don't I don't want to get. We didn't come out with the regulations until 1994. Uh, and was there a name for those other than 417? No, the the four, no, they weren't 417. We had a new number for them, and I don't oh, remember okay. what the number was. Okay. The 417 were already, they were implemented in the 60s. Okay, those so I'm sorry. I, I yeah. thought this was an expansion of the 417. Well, it built on it. Yeah, it built on it, but it did not change them. It was going to be a new, new. regulation. Okay. And I'll, I'll come back to that because that's we started that with Dennis, and that was part of our role to try to provide some leadership. And I'll come back to that because we went through this re review process in 1994. But I'm getting, getting ahead of myself. You know, 88, we recognized the problem. 89, I think Dennis came in as commissioner, started encouraging us to be more proactive. We began the regulations. But the other thing that we began is we said, look, this problem in California uh, is not a good one because there's going to have to be ag to urban transfers, seven-party agreement with the unquantified entitlements uh, and the tiered entitlements doesn't really accommodate that. We need a new framework for the seven-party agreement to allow water to, use for, to move from ag to urban use. And so what we did is we wrote a letter to the Colorado River Board of California and we said, there's a problem here, seven-party agreement doesn't work. We think the entitlements under the seven-party agreement need to be quantified. And we think all of the uh, uh, California entities ought to get together and negotiate a new arrangement on how those water... This is like 1990 we did this. And we then uh, actually started attending meetings with the California parties on a regular basis, trying to help them get together and negotiate a quantified entitlement. And, uh, you know, I think they, they all recognized, and we were encouraged. I mean, we, we, in the initial discussions, we were encouraged that, you know, something could happen here. There could be a solution to this problem. And, uh, and but w w our vision at that time was that everybody's entitled to get quantified. Palo Verde, Bard, uh, Imperial, and Coachella, and they all get a number. And all those numbers in total would add up to 3.85 million acre feet. And then you would have a basis for transfers to occur. You, would, you wouldn't be jumping over lower entitlement holders. You, you would get this final number. Well, Palo Verde didn't like that idea. They thought, you know, why would we ever agree to a cap? Bard was not really, a, or the Yuma project really didn't play much of a role. They would just kind of watch from afar. And Imperial didn't like the idea of a cap. Coachella loved the idea of a cap. And of course, Metropolitan thought it thought a quantified entitlement was a good idea too. So we had, basically we had Coachella and Met that thought it was a good idea. And the other three that were willing to engage discussions um, but were reluctant to, it was okay if the other guy quantified but they didn't want to quantify. And we, we facilitated, we had a number of meetings, we facilitated those meetings and we had good discussions and you know I think it, it, was, it was fairly good. It became real apparent that, uh, and so what we did is we wrote them a letter, and we said, if you guys don't agree on how to quantify your entitlements, the secretary has this responsibility and an authority under the Boulder Canyon Act and the Supreme Court decree to administer entitlements, and we're going to issue our own decision on how those entitlements will be administered, and we'll quantify it for you. 
We actually sent a letter to the Colorado River Board and all of those entities saying, the secretary is going to quantify your entitlements if you can't agree on how to do it. Who, who would have signed that letter? I believe Bob Tolles signed that letter in 1992. As, uh, what was his, his position was? As, uh, it, at 91 or 92. He was then now the new regional director. Okay, so Maybe Ed, Ed Hallebeck is gone. Yeah, actually, I, 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 Ed retired. Okay. Uh, but I think Ed retired with Dennis's urging. <laughs> you know, I said there was a conflict in styles, and there was. And I think, you know, Dennis didn't see eye to eye with Ed on his management style, and I think Dennis kind of pushed, helped push Ed out. Ed, Ed was a great guy, and, you know, it's just too bad that their management styles didn't mesh up, uh, because I think, you know, they, they, they both could have seen the, the same thing. But anyway... Ed retired. That was just rumor that Dennis pushed him out. I mean, you know, I don't really know. I wasn't part of any of those discussions. You weren't in the office at the time. Uh, yeah, I was. So, okay. so Bob, Bob Tolles became the regional director after Ed. That was probably about 91 that Bob Tolles became. 90 or 91, Bob Tolles became uh, regional director. So this letter is received by the agencies? And yes, and uh, we say if you don't have it done, we're going to do it by March of, uh, I think it was 92. In March of 92, we're going to we're gonna allocate, and Dennis was still commissioner. And I remember we sat down with Dennis in the drafting of that letter, and he actually reviewed and commented back and supported the letter. Anyway, then what happened was there became this uh, realization that maybe if Imperial and Coachella could just negotiate a quantification, maybe you didn't have to quantify Palo Verde and the Yuma project, there could just be a quantification of Imperial and there could be an agreement between Coachella and Imperial on a quantification. And if you could do that, then Imperial could transfer and you wouldn't have Coachella because Imperial is where most of the transfers are going to come from anyway because they're so big and they have so much water. And so maybe, and so Imperial and Coachella embarked in the early 90s on some pretty extensive negotiations, and I don't remember the exact time frame, and they got very close. In fact, they came to an agreement, and uh, uh, they actually came to an agreement, the negotiating teams, on how to settle the problem between the two of them. And they actually took it to the boards, and I think the Coachella board approved it, and the, the uh, Imperial Board was going to approve it. And uh, there was a, a board member uh, on the board at the time. And he's the brother of the board member that serves today. Maybe you can help me. Uh, Menville. Right. The Menvilles. And, uh, Ralph, I think. Yeah, it might have been Ralph Menville. And he's got a brother that's, is it John? John. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that, that's on the board today. But they had this long discussion in, in the Imperial Board, and <laughs> Ralph Menville threw out a, uh, a thing. Well, you know, I could agree to this if, and he threw a new condition out there that Coachella had to agree to. And so the Imperial negotiators went back to Coachella, and that was the end of it. It didn't. It was over a small quantity of water. If we could get an additional, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but anyway, it just it tanked the negotiations. They fell close. So they were very close to quantifying in 1991 and 1992. And in 1992, they didn't quantify, and we had threatened that we were if they didn't. And so we did. We sat down. We looked at all of the beneficial uses and the historical uses. We took into consideration the priorities, and we actually put a letter together that we sent back to all of the entities in California, saying, we're, and Dennis was still commissioner. This is right at the end of Dennis's tenure as commissioner. I remember actually sitting down with Dennis and briefing Dennis on what we were doing and drafting the letter and what are, what are the amounts that we're going to assign to each one of the districts. Dennis actually played a role in that, looking at those numbers and say, yeah, those are good numbers. That's what we ought to use. And uh, so anyway, Bob Tolles, who was the regional director, signed that letter in 1992 to all of the Californians saying, we're going to quantify your entitlements and here's how we're going to do it. Here's the, here's the amounts that we're 
and we're going to move forward and do this. But the letter just kind of announced we're going to do it, and here's how we've assigned water supplies. So we actually had a, an amount of water allocated for Imperial and Palo Verde and Bard, and I don't remember the exact numbers. I do remember the number that we gave to Coachella, and it was 370,000 acre feet. And Coachella was, their historical use had been around 300. And, uh, but they felt like they needed a lot more. And, and uh, Tom Levy was thrilled with that number. <laughs> he thought, of, and, and as it turned out, the other three districts went ballistic. They all wrote letters, we're gonna sue you. You know, this is, uh, this is the, uh, you know, you can't do this under the law, you have no basis to do this. And Coachella was the only one that liked it. And I think Metropolitan liked it. Uh, so Metropolitan and uh, Coachella liked what we did and the other, the other three were very upset or threatening litigation. And the reaction was so strong. We actually thought that there was a chance, because they had gotten so close, we actually thought that there was a chance if we threw something on the table, they might embrace it. And obviously not all of them were going to embrace it. And uh, so anyway, we kind of just, at that point in time, we just kind of let it ride. We didn't give a response. We didn't move forward. We just kind of let it ride. And then Dennis left, and uh, new commissioner, uh, Dan Beard, came in. And the other thing that happened then is there was two things that happened. One, the Arizona project began to have financial problems. And You're talking about the CAP? The CAP, the Central Arizona project began to have financial problems. And the water was more expensive than the farmers in Central Arizona could afford. And they quit taking as much water. Their water use backed off substantially. At the same time, there was a white fly infestation in the whole region. That white fly hit uh, Central Al or Imperial. Uh, it hit all along the river and it held, hit Central Arizona, and it just killed uh, crop production. And uh, so, that, so ag use dropped off tremendously, and water use in the lower basin came in significantly under the seven and a half million acre feet. Water use actually dropped down pretty close to 7 million acre feet in the lower basin. So we weren't over the entitlements. The pressure to enforce the decree subsided. You know, we, we had, uh, we weren't going over 7.5 million acre feet. So we just kind of let it ride uh, and, uh, and didn't press the quantification too hard at that point in time. And uh, it just kind of, just kind of sat there. And then we, we were, th th this other debate was still ongoing over surplus uh, and whether or not the secretary should declare, if we did go over seven and a half. So the basin states were still having that debate every year when we developed the annual operating plan. California continued to argue for surplus. The other six states continued to argue against surplus. Every year the Bureau would finesse the language in the annual operating plan not to take a position and so we were finessing that problem and uh, again we began to recognize and I talked about this earlier and Dennis was still these the quantification separate from these regulations dealing uh, with management of the of the lower basin so we polished up our our regulations Dennis had left as commissioner we now had Dan Beard as commissioner Larry Hancock was the regional director. He, Bob Tolts had retired, and now uh, Larry Hancock had come in as regional director. And, uh, and, and, and you're still in Boulder City. I'm still in Boulder okay. City, although at this point in time, I had moved up to become the deputy regional director. Okay. So I moved from my job as the chief of the Water, Land, and Power into the deputy regional director job, which was a, which was a promotion. And, uh, so anyway, we go ahead and finish this draft of these regulations, and similar to what we did on the quantification, we floated them. We put them out to all seven states and all the water users in the lower basin. And just like the quantification, this is 1994 that we put them out, everybody went ballistic. <laughs> Arizona primarily was really upset. And we had actually put a provision in there that would allow interstate water transfers to occur. 
So if a water user in Arizona wanted to sell water to somebody in California or Nevada, these regulations laid out a framework for how that could happen. And what we did is we kind of built on a uh, concept that some states were putting in state law which said that conservation was beneficial use. And that if somebody conserved water, they could claim that conservation as a beneficial use by themselves, and then they could sell that water to whoever they wanted to sell that water to. And that the Secretary's authority as water master would allow that frame, we would account for the water as being used in the state where the conservation occurred because conservation is beneficial use, and then allow the water to be diverted and to another entity, and it could be within the state or outside the state. Arizona would just went ballistic over that. There's no way under the decree and the, you know, the legal framework that the secretary could do that. They were just very upset. And they went back to the secretary, who was Bruce Babbitt, Secretary of Interior now was Bruce Babbitt. From Arizona. From Arizona, <laughs> former governor of Arizona. And Betsy Rieke, who was the former director of the Department of Water Resources, uh, in Arizona, uh, was there as the Assistant Secretary of Interior for Water and Science, so she was our boss uh, over reclamation. And Dan Beard was the Commissioner of Reclamation, but Dan did not get involved in this. I gotta say, Dan pretty much stayed out of this. This was an issue that Betsy was gonna deal with, and I think he and Betsy had kind of worked out an arrangement where they would pick their issues and not get one, not one another's way. So anyway, Arizona went back and just really complained strongly to the secretary and Betsy. Now the secretary and Betsy were very forward-thinking people and very, uh, very uh, proactive, wanted to find creative solutions to water problems. And the secretary, Secretary Babbitt, he was very interested in the Colorado River. He knew the history. He was an Arizona governor. He appreciated the conflicts of the states. And as secretary, he was look, I think he was looking for things that he could claim as his. You know, what did I accomplish while I was secretary? And I think one of the things that he identified was the Colorado River. There's a need on the Colorado River uh, for the secretary to play a role, and there's a lot of controversy. And I'd like to be, a, you know, I'd like, under my administration, I'd like to be that, some, that something that I can claim as secretary as having accomplished. So he wanted to play, but he was getting beat up by his own state over what we were trying. We were trying to do that. Okay, we were trying to be proactive and help solve some problems, but we had done it probably in less than a diplomatic way and we were creating political problems for he and, for he and Betsy. So Betsy came back to us as in, in the Bureau and said, look, you know, these regulations are a good idea. You know, we want to be proactive and figure out how to manage the river. I said, he said, she said, but these are just going too far. And, you know, they're just, we've really got a lot of upset here and we need to step back and take a deep breath and try to move forward. So what she did is she told us, she said, uh, let's start a new process and let's sit down with the three lower basin states and let's start doing some work to see what we can do that all three states can agree to. We all recognize that something needs to be done. So let's, let's renew the dialogue and sit down in a, in a friendly way. And this was like late 1994 that uh, she said this. So we formed a group of the Lower Basin states. We included the Colorado River Indian Tribe in Arizona in the discussion, but we had uh, Larry Linzer, who was the deputy director from the state of Arizona, a very highly thought of guy and been there for a long time, well liked by all the basin states and within Arizona, trusted by everybody. We had Jerry Zimmerman, who was the executive director of the Colorado River Board. Uh, we had uh, Pat Mulroy, uh, and, and, and for Pat Mulroy, we had Dave Donnelly, who was her assistant general manager. Really, all, all those people, very good people. Uh, and we had, uh, uh, from the Colorado River Indian Tribe, we had Gary Hansen, uh, who, who represented them. And then we had myself and Bill Swan and uh, LeGrand Nielsen from the Bureau. And I think that was a fairly small group. So we sat down in late 94 and we formed what we called a technical committee. 
and we said, okay, let's brainstorm. Let's set everything aside, you know, let's just sit and let's brainstorm. What can we do to manage this river system better? That, that's win-win. No, nobody loses. Th th these have got to be win-win solutions. What things can be done that's proactive that helps solve these problems? And of course, we were, we'd been advocating interstate marketing and interstate transfers of water that, you know, nobody's harmed. Farmer gets paid for reducing use. The water goes somewhere. Nobody else in the state, you know, th those are win-win kind of solutions. And Arizona, you know, objected to that pretty strongly. Um, but anyway, we spent about six months brainstorming, and we came together on a framework that would allow a form of interstate cooperation called interstate water banking, where uh, you could take water and put it in a bank and store it when it's available on the Colorado River system, and then the state where the water is stored can agree to uh, when there's a dry spell and and the other states need the water, the state that stored the water can agree to pump that water rather than take Colorado River water and then the other state can take and use the Colorado River water. So we came up with this water banking concept and all three states in the course of these discussions had and in this technical kit committee kind of concluded that that could work. Arizona in particular had a lot of groundwater uh, storage. I mean, they had overdrafted their groundwater basins for years. There was lots of capacity for them to store water in their groundwater basins. Of course, California had some. Nevada was fairly limited, but it was thought, you know, when you got extra water, let's store it for use, and then we'll, we, and, and the state that stores the water will get paid by the state that's going to get the water in the future, and then that water can be exchanged. So it was a form of interstate marketing, what I would call a form. But it had a different legal framework. It took on a different arrangement. Uh, we defined a new term called intentionally created surplus uh, because there are, under the law of the river, there is this ability for the secretary to declare surpluses and allow more water to flow to another state, which is what California had been arguing. So we argued that if you took this specific action to store water and the state paid for doing it, then the secretary could call that water surplus and allow it to be used in another state outside the strict limits of the decree. So it, it wasn't a case where, let's say Arizona, just for uh, clarity, uh, assume Arizona has an entitlement to 2.8 million acre feet and assume they only use 2.6 for consumptive use. They couldn't store the additional 200,000 just because they couldn't use it. They had to have taken some action to reduce their use to create the storage. Is well, that well, the idea was is they would store it for another state. So if there was water in the river that they didn't have a direct consumptive need for, they had a right to 2.8, uh -huh. but say they were using 2.6, right. Nevada could pay them to take that extra 200,000 acre foot and put it in storage. Oh, I see. And, so the, and, then, and then later on, maybe Nevada doesn't need the water the year it gets put in storage. Then later on, when Nevada needs the water and there's limitations on the system, then they could go to Arizona and say, well, pump that 200,000 acre feet that you put in storage and we'll take part of your 2.8 million acre feet over here in Nevada. So the intentionally created surplus did not require them to literally conserve that amount of water that they were storing. It was just unused entitlement. Right. Okay, it, good. It could, it could be unused entitlement. It could be surplus. It could be water that was created by conservation. Uh, it was water that they put in storage uh, for use by another state. That, that was the concept. Okay, that that, that's be, a good you know, clarification. All the water. Th this is under the groundwater banking. Now, later on, under the... 2007 guidelines, and we, we have intentionally created surplus in that as well, but that has to come from conservation. But at this point in time, the water that got stored in an interstate banking program didn't necessarily have to, to come from conservation. Okay, and, and the year again is 94? This is 94. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and so we developed this framework, and it was like April, May of 95, 
that we begin pretty much developing this consensus among the three basin states that here's a form of interstate. The Bureau came out and said, we're going to allow interstate cooperation and interstate transfer of water, and here's how we're going to do it. The three states didn't like, or, well, Arizona didn't like that. So now we had sat down and negotiated a new framework on how that could occur, and all three states were agreeing. And man, we were excited. We saw this as a big breakthrough. In fact, didn't Arizona start a whole new bureaucracy? Yes, uh, and they still have it today. They still have it today. And Arizona could use that money to help put their facilities in place by taking money from other states and allowing that to occur. Okay. I, I think we're talking about the Arizona Groundwater Banking Authority? Is right. That, okay. Yeah, I think that's what it's called, something along those lines. But that hadn't been created yet. Right. But, so these were the early... Fr and what started that whole thing, what started this whole thing was our regulations. In fact, uh, Herb Dishlet told me that if we had not put those regulations out in 94 the way they were, you would have never got anybody to come to this idea of interstate banking. That really drove the process. And I, I would say that's the first time, or one of the first times, the Bureau was starting to play a more proactive role, trying to provide leadership, saying, here's problems, here's solutions, you know, let's, let's, we got to solve these problems, and using that that uh, playing the card of, of Watermaster, saying, look, these are problems. We've got to administer the river. We want everybody to get together and, and work on solving these problems. And oh, by the way, if, if, if we can't get you to solve them, we're going to have to administer the river, and we'll make the decisions on solving them ourselves. So we started to play that. That's when we started to play that card, and the Secretary's been playing that card ever since <laughs> on issues, time and time again as these issues come along. Uh, but anyway, uh, we were in April and May. Everybody had agreed on this framework. Everybody was really excited about, uh, about what was happening. And we thought we had consensus among three states. And we were going to gear up to put some new regulations in place to implement this interstate cooperation. Rather than the ones we had written, we were now going to write a new set of regulations that would implement this consensus on how the lower basin could be managed. And we were really excited about it. We thought we were there. And in April or May, something happened within the state of Arizona. Uh, they had water users that looked at this, and I don't know who they were, but they de Arizona decided they didn't like it. You know, we negotiated, there was a consensus, and now Arizona people were looking at it and saying, no, this is not a good deal. We don't want to do this. And so what happened in, in like, May... Uh, the deal started to fall apart. Uh, now, parallel with this, with this process, remember I mentioned that Central Arizona Projects started using less water and that there were financial problems within the Central Arizona Project? Right. Well, that had grown much worse. I mean, that, that problem really got magnified during that same period of time. So we were working on all these things at the same time. It was really an interesting... But the whole time I was involved, I mean, there were just so many tough problems and things going on. It was just really neat to be a part of it. And uh, But anyway, we had these problems on the Central Arizona Project at the same time. They were financial problems. Agriculture couldn't pay their costs on the Central Arizona Project. They were declaring bankruptcy. The loans that the government, that the federal, that the bureau had made to to these districts to build their systems, they were defaulting, and that was creating a lot of embarrassment for the bureau and and the whole financial framework. The repayment of the project by the Central Arizona Water Conservancy District was uh, no longer working. You know, the finance because the ag was failing, the repayment of the whole project was failing. So we had these huge problems on the Central Arizona Project and how it was going to be repaid. And so we were negotiating from about 1990, parallel with this time when all these issues are going on in the Colorado River, to try to figure out how to solve the Central Arizona Project problems. And again, now we've got Secretary Babbitt and Betsy Rieke from Arizona while we're trying to negotiate these financial problems. And in early 95 we actually got a, an agreement, an agreement in principle with Arizona on the Central Arizona Project and solving these problems. We actually got an agreement put in place on how we were going to restructure and repay the Central Arizona Project. And 
it was a, it was an agreement principle, and so we continued to move forward right while all this was going on at the same time, in in uh, getting that agreement signed, and we actually had uh, scheduled uh, a time for the secretary to come out. We were going to have a big public ceremony here in Phoenix, uh, where the secretary was going to sign this agreement principle with the Central Arizona Water Conservation District that was going to put in place a new financial framework. And uh, about during the same time that that was going to happen, this deal with the states was falling apart. And Pat Mulroy was really pissed off. Pat was the general manager of the Las Vegas Valley Water District. And, and, and I think the Southern Nevada Water Authority was in place at that time. And, th and they were representing. And the deal that had been negotiated on this groundwater banking was really beneficial. To Arizona, I, re I mean to Nevada, and it was really a big deal to them. And all of a sudden, this was falling apart. Okay, let me stop you there, yeah. only because we're going to run out of tape yeah. in the middle of a sentence, and I don't want to do that. Uh, so this will mark the end of tape two. When we took a short break here, we were kind of in the middle of a groundwater banking deal going on in the mid 1990s 94 95 right in that time frame if you want to pick up on that yeah uh, well I was talking about the, the the groundwater banking discussions with the three lower basin states and we pretty much came to an agreement and then in at the same time we were negotiating the central Arizona project financial settlement and uh, and we pretty but that did not involve the other states that was just with Arizona and we pretty much solved that at the same time. So we have both of those agreements kind of in place. And just as we were ready to move forward on both, the state of Arizona decided that they didn't like the groundwater banking agreement and they backed away from it. Said no. Rita Pearson was the director of the Department of Water Resources. And uh, basically she said no, uh, we're, not, we're not willing to you know, move forward with this idea. And, uh, but at the same time, we were moving ahead with the Central Arizona deal. Well, Pat Mulroy was very upset. And Pat, Pat can be pretty vociferous in her uh, 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 and she was justifiably upset uh, because, you know, we thought we had a deal that was a huge benefit to them. It was going to solve some problems for everybody in the lower basin, and then now Arizona's back in the way. So she's just really mad. Pat also knows that we've pretty much solved Arizona's financial problems on the Central Arizona project. And so Pat is thinking to herself, man, you know, we got a, a secretary from Arizona. I'm, now, some of this I'm speculating on. you got to appreciate it. But my, my sense of what happened, and I've kind of put this together uh, over the years in, in retrospect, but I think Pat was really upset that Arizona was getting its deal and at the same time Arizona was nixing Nevada's deal. And so Arizona was going to get a solution to its water problem with fixing the Central Arizona project, and then Arizona was walking away from fixing Nevada, or helping to fix Nevada's problem, or at least providing some relief. It didn't completely fix Nevada's problem, but at least it helped. And Pat was very upset. Pat was also very good friends with Dan Beard, who was the commissioner of reclamation at that time. And... Uh, uh, and uh, she was just generally upset. And there was Arizonans in control in the Interior Department. Uh, Bruce Babbitt was the secretary. Betsy Rieke was the assistant secretary. So, that was the view that Arizona was in control. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that was. And, and so Arizona was get, getting the Arizonans in the Interior Department was cutting a fat cat uh, with Arizona, and everybody else was getting the short end of the stick. So she was really upset. I think she complained to Dan Beard. Actually, at a point there, in, in, right in that time frame in May, when it was all falling apart, my boss, who was the regional director at the time, Larry Hancock, came to me. I, I had ended up being the lead on both, of, for reclamation, being the lead on both of these. Uh, I was actually the one that was trying to put together the, this final agreement in May. I was the assistant regional director at the time. And I was actually on the phone with Secretary Babbitt directly from time to time 
working out the arrangements for this agreement in principle or the final agreement in principle. Not a lot of discussion, but a lot. And, you know, we're, we're skipping a lot of people in the chain of command to have an assistant regional director talking directly to the secretary. And Larry, <laughs> my boss, was not involved, and Dan Beard was not involved. Betsy Rickey was involved, and the secretary was involved. So I was kind of working through. Well, my boss, Larry Hancock, came to me and said, Bob, Dan, and I want you to nix this uh, Central Arizona project deal. He says, we want you to go to the press. We want you to tell everybody what a bad deal it is for the federal government. We just want you to destroy the whole thing. I mean, do whatever you can to stop it. And man, that was really putting me in a tough place. Here's my boss telling me to nix it. I'd been involved in negotiating it. And here's the secretary and the assistant secretary that I'd been working with on it, and they want it to go forward. And I kind of felt conflicted. I told Larry I couldn't, that I couldn't uh, do what he wanted me to do, that I'd been too involved in it. And he backed off. I am, and and he, he actually said he and the commissioner at the time, Dan Beard, wanted, wanted to have it nixed. My guess is, and I've kind of pieced this together, Dan and Pat Mulroy were pretty close. They were good friends. They had worked together when he was working for Congressman Miller in Congress. And, um, At George Miller of California. Yes, yes. And uh, I think that uh, Pat was so upset with uh, uh, Arizona. She probably had discussions with Dan. And my guess is Dan probably told Pat, well, you ought to step in and try to do something about this lousy deal that the government's getting with Arizona on the Central Arizona Project. Well, what happened is Pat went to her governor, Governor Miller of Nevada, and to her two senators, uh, Senator Reed and Senator Bryan from uh, Nevada, and said, Nevada's getting the short end of the stick, Arizona's winning. The political power in in uh, the Interior Department from Arizona is having its way, and this ain't fair. Well, Secretary or Governor Miller called President Clinton directly, and I understand Governor Miller had a good relationship with President Clinton, and told President Clinton that Nevada that Arizona was getting the sweetheart deal, and Nevada was getting the short end of the stick, and it was all Arizona's fault. And my guess is the Arizona power in the Interior Department is, you know, complicit in this whole thing. The, so so the, the bottom line is uh, Nevada got very upset and complained at the highest levels of government about what was going on. And I think that the President probably and the White House started looking into what was going on in Interior. Uh, at the same time, it was really interesting, it's kind of like the Coachella deal that I talked about earlier, Coachella and Imperial, where the deal got changed at the last minute and it fell apart. While we were still putting together the final pieces of this agreement in principle to settle the CAP problems. This was in May. We had the secretary scheduled to come and sign it in early June. So that deal was moving ahead. And there were some very complicated and difficult issues between the government and CAWCD over Indian tribes in Arizona and how they participated in the Central Arizona Project and what their participation could be and how much water could be allocated to tribes for use under the sun. And we were very, very, I mean, we pretty much agreed to most of that in this agreement in principle. But there was an issue that came up as we were putting together the final agreement in principle where we wanted to put language and BIA and the tribes wanted to put, the Bureau was more trying to facilitate it, but they wanted to put language in the uh, agreement in principle that Indian tribes could buy water from willing sellers, willing non-Indian sellers of the Central Arizona Project at some future date if they wanted to. And the Central Arizona Project objected vehemently to that. They did not like the idea that Indian tribes could buy more water. They were going to get their allocation. That was all they got. They didn't want Indian tribes coming in and buying more water. And it was a very difficult issue. We had a negotiating session in late May uh, trying to iron out that issue. And we actually negotiated all day and all night. I remember leaving. We ordered pizza about 1 o'clock in the morning. And we walked out of the Central Arizona project offices about uh, 7 in the morning 
and we had started about eight or nine the morning before. We negotiated all, all night on a number of issues. We settled them all. When we left that meeting that day, we had settled them all. The way we had settled that particular issue was we just removed the language. We stayed silent on whether or not Indian tribes could buy water or not. So it was just, we just left that out of there. Here's a compromise. We're not going to say we can, we're not going to say we can't. And the staff for the Central Arizona Project agreed to that at the time. And so we had this agreement in principle all negotiated, and we were ready to go to tell the secretary to come out and sign it. At the same time, President Clinton's getting called from Nevada, and they're looking into this deal, this Arizona deal, and I'm sure they're looking over Secretary Babbitt's uh, shoulder on what was going on. And so anyway, uh, it went to the board for approval, just like the Coachella deal. And when the board got it, the board said, oh, we got to have that language in there that says Indian tribes can't buy water. And so what the board did is they put that language back in the agree agreement and approved it, approved their version of the agreement. And then they came back to us and said, oh, the board's approved it. We, we put that objectionable clause back in, but the board's approved it. We're ready to go ahead. And uh, so I don't remember if the secretary called me. I, I, I think he was actually going to get on the plane to come out west. And one of the things he was going to do was swing through Arizona and sign this agreement. And he and I talked on the phone. And I, he said, well, he says, where are we? And I said, well, I said, you know, we worked all night. We thought we had agreement. And there's this one issue, and here's, I explained the issue to him, and I said, and the CAWCD put it back in, and the board's approved it. So, you know, we're, we've got a dilemma here on what we do. And his comment back, back to me was, well, I guess we don't got a deal. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, the, the political pressure from the White House was coming in, and then we had this technical issue. I, I think Secretary Babbitt, if it hadn't have been for that issue, in spite of the White House, in Nevada. I think he would have come and signed that agreement in principle. But when Arizona changed that one piece of language, uh, you know, with all the pressure and everything else, you know, we didn't have a deal. Yeah. And I think it, that when the CAP folks did that. Now, uh, that deal all fell all apart. The, the deal with the states all fell apart. Shortly after then, in 1995, CAWCD filed litigation against the United States over the repayment issues. We in, entered into a very, very contentious negotiating process, with it, or court process with CAWCD. We had a number of hearings. We, it, we, it, those hearings would have run on forever. And uh, we finally settled out of court on the issues, and the settlement didn't actually get implemented until uh, 2000 and Six or 2007. So well, that, that took 13 years to solve the CAP problem. <laughs> we, we tried to move back forward with these interstate banking regulations. Arizona would not cooperate. They walked away from. We hired a facilitator to come in. The secretary personally participated in meetings to try to move the ball forward on this interstate banking concept. Uh, Arizona refused to participate. Wouldn't even come to the meetings. However, that ultimately got resolved, and in 1999, we implemented regulations on interstate banking that did pretty much the framework that we had in place in 1995. So ultimately, those regulations did get implemented by Secretary Babbitt, but it took a long time for it to occur. But anyway, it was real, those were really interesting times for me personally, because here I was dealing with the Cabinet Secretary. The President and the White House were involved. I remember being back in Washington and actually going to the White House to meet with some of the White House staff on the issue and what was going on and uh, the battle. And uh, so it, it was, that was a very, I felt like I was down in a, in a foxhole and the, the bullets were firing over the top of my head. <laughs> there were big headlines in the Arizona papers about the CAP deal, I mean frontline head, headlines of the Arizona Republic. Yeah. Babbitt abandons Arizona. <laughs> oh, I do remember. Uh, there, there was, it was just a big deal publicly. The secretary in his home state got a lot of negative publicity out of it. That was unfair, quite frankly. I don't think that there was anything fair. I think it was uh, 
carefully orchestrated by the water community in Arizona and the press in Arizona uh, to really attack Babbitt over this whole thing, really put him in a tough spot. But anyway, that was, those were really interesting times. Well, Bob, I think in the interest of your time, uh, I know you need to get out of here. We may uh, pick this up at a later time, I'm not sure, but I do want to put a, an end just a logical end on this one with respect to your career. Just to, just give me like a minute uh, and just take me through to your retirement in terms of your role at, in the Bureau of Reclamation. Mm -hmm. we, we left you as uh, the assistant uh, mm -hmm. regional director mm -hmm. and uh, how do, how, just tell me how you moved up. Well, you know, I, I became the regional director in uh, 1995, at the end of 95. Okay. Uh, and then, and, and the story on that is kind of an interesting story, and it all played back into this problem we had, uh, and I won't go into that. But anyway, I became regional director in 1995. I was regional director and very much involved in all the things that happened on the river from that point forward. Uh, and in 2006, I went from being regional director to the Commissioner of Reclamation, so I went back to Washington again as Commissioner of Rec Reclamation, and then I retired. Uh, in uh, January of uh, 2009, so I've been retired about a year now from the Bureau. Okay, excellent. Well, like I say, uh, we certainly appreciate your time today, and uh, we are definitely going to try to pick this up at a later time, and, and we'll just pick it up from where we just left off. Yeah. So good. thank you very much, Bob.